Carol, as Carol mentioned, we'll be talking about spectral methods for clustering two types of families of, of graphs. Um, sorry to those of you that have seen shorter version of this uh, talk earlier this year, but it was much shorter, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And uh, I've tried to also add a bit more uh, context and tell you a bit about the um, bigger picture and also some uh, with an eye towards a uh, future application that we are considering or will consider in the near future. So I think these two families of graphs signed in directors have been relatively uh, unexplored in the last uh, uh, decade or so in the networks literature. So I'm going to structure the talk in two ways. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, signed graphs and then about directed graphs. And then I'll say a little bit about applications to uh, ranking and also dis discuss some uh, broader themes between these two problems in terms of finding the so-called plant structures in these types of graphs. So just a quick recap on, on clustering graphs. So the typical setting is we have an unsigned graph G with n vertices and typically edges have positive weight associated with them. In WIG that encodes some sort of similarity be between the endpoints. And typically the similarity, for example, can be constructed via some, Gaussian, some, some kernel of choice that is a function of the distance between Xi and Xj. So there can be nodes in the network, there can be streams, images, and so on. And the goal is to partition the node set V into clusters such that the intra-cluster edges have much higher weight than the inter-cluster uh, edges, right? So this uh, clustering problem has had tons of applications in <clears throat> many different uh, many different areas. <clears throat> and lots of people are working on this um, idea of, of clustering from different angles, spectral methods, and definite programming, and so on. So one fundamental concept that we're going to need throughout the talk is that of a graph cut. So if we have a, 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 a graph G, a partition of it into two subgraphs A and B, is denoted as a cut and will be given by the sum of the weights of the edges that connect the two subgroups. So here you see an example where we uh, split uh, G into A and B, and the cut is just uh, the sum of the total weights of the edges that flow from A to B. And this notion of a cut has been a fundamental concept in, in graph clustering has been around for two, two decades now. And the goal here, we want to partition G into A, B in order to minimize the resulting cut, right? So one very popular idea of, of, of clustering on graphs is that, is that a spectral clustering. So just in a nutshell, a, a quick one, one slide recap, the idea is spectral clustering is to embed the endpoints into RK and to perform k-means clustering uh, in, this, in this embedding space. And typically this embedding is given by the extremal eigenvectors of a suitably defined uh, graph uh, matrix, typically like a graph Laplace or some variation of it. So she and Malik about 20 years ago, they introduced this um, normalized cut function, which is just uh, the goal is we try to find clusters C1 to CK such that when you sum up over all the clusters, we want to minimize that something that's called a normalized cut. So this is just a cut of CI. So basically uh, this all the edges leaving C sub I and normalized by the volume of the CI, but the volume is defined just the sum of the degrees of uh, in, in A. So this uh, penalization here by the volume is just to promote uh, staying away from trivial size clusters, right? If the cluster size is very small, this quantity will blow up, right? And it will hurt your objective function to try to minimize. But unfortunately, this normalized cut is uh, the discrete optimization problem and is shown to be NP hard in the worst case. And the idea is we can relax this discreteness constraints in, uh, uh, in this normalized cut, the discreteness constraints being that this indicator vectors, they have to be proper cluster indicators, zero, one, and we relax them. Should to, have. Uh, sorry? Okay, and uh, and the solution is given by the smallest k eigenvectors of this uh, normalized Laplacian matrix here, d inverse uh, d to the minus one half times l times d to the minus one half, where d is a diagonal matrix with the degrees on the diagonal, and, and l is just the usual uh, Laplacian of g, so l is defined as d minus g, right? And uh, we get our embedding by considering the uh, extremal uh, k eigenvectors of the matrix, and then once we have this embedding, you apply your favorite k-means clustering algorithm, k-means plus plus or whatever clustering method you want to get back the final embedding, okay? So now one um, twist that uh, we've been looking at for, for a while now is that of a signed graph. So in a lot of this application that involve graphs where the edge weights can take both positive and negative values. So the negative values they think can be interpreted to take to denote some dissimilarity information. So in social networks, you have friends and enemies, in image segmentation, you can have edges encoding adjacent pixels and they can also encode the dissimilarity information between the pixels. But uh, really the motivation that I, I arrived at is, is, is coming from uh, time series clustering. So if you're given time series and you want to cluster them, a natural thing to do is compute the correlation matrix and then um, uh, try to cluster this matrix. But this matrix, will, of course, will have entries in between minus one and one. 
right? And the goal here, can we split our graph into uh, a cluster such that we maximize the sum of the weights of the positive edges uh, that are intra-cluster because positive edges, if you find the cluster assignment, if you want to make a positive edge happy, you have to put inside the cluster because that's what it uh, encodes, right? But we also want to maximize the sum of our negative edges lying across clusters because if you want to make a negative edge happy, you have to put it across clusters, right? Or you can uh, flip it and uh, frame it as a minimization problem, which but it's, not, it's exactly the same thing. Right, and this is one reference I typically like to show on uh, some groups, uh, some people here in Oxford about 10 years ago, they, they proposed a number of methods for turning time series into, into networks that I thought was, was quite useful and uh, could be a good starting point whenever you're given time series and to, you want to back out a, a network out of it. And they have ways also to sparsify the network if you, and in the end, we, uh, this also motivates the, the need for uh, proposing algorithms for uh, the deal with, uh, with sparse matrices. So just a, a very quick, simple example, what happens in the case of k equal to two? But this can also be seen as an instance of what's called the group synchronization problem over the, the group Z2. So in, in this problem, uh, you have group elements, plus minus one, living at the nodes of the graph, and the edges encode ratios of the group elements. Yeah, so in, uh, in Z2, an element is its own inverse. So if you take a group ratio of the two endpoints, uh, an edge would just measure the product of the endpoints. So here if I have a plus one, here I have a minus one, then the edge measurement would be minus one, just the product of the, the product of the two. So th think of the edges encoding similarity or dissimilarity. If they're both plus one or both minus one, right? Then the edge weight will be plus one, right? But the problem is somebody comes and then with some probability, uh, P and adversary will flip some of the signs on your network, right? So you can think of this uh, uh, sign flipping on the edges as being noise in the problem, right? Uh, and so potential measurement graph could be, you're trying to build this capital Z matrix IJ, where whenever the measurement is correct, you measure ZI, ZJ inverse. So this is just ZI times Z, Z, ZJ, or you measure uh, the flipped version of it if the measurement is incorrect, right? Or you measure, you measure zero if it's a completely missing edge, okay? And you have the original solution, Z1 to ZN that uh, are the ground truth group elements plus minus one, right? And the task is, can we find an approximate solution X1 to XN that are also you know, ideally in plus minus one, such that we satisfy as many pairwise group relations as possible. So again, you can think of happy and unhappy edges, right? You give me the network, right? I don't see the node labels. I only see the edge labels. And I want to be able to find assignment of plus minus ones to maximize the number of happy edges, right? So here's one simple way that you can uh, do this is to consider maximizing the following quadratic form that essentially counts intra-cluster happiness. Uh, well, this is just xi, xj times aij. Right, if you think a bit about this, this is what will um, be given. And this, we know how to write on a quadratic form. It's just maximization of X transpose AX, where A is your measurement matrix, where X1 to Xn are vectors in Z to N. And the maximum of this is attained when our vector X is just the, the ground truth, the noise for data. But in practice, this problem has noise. This problem is also MP hard. Uh, we cannot solve it exactly, but we relax it by dropping the plus minus one constraints. So this in, in, uh, integer con con uh, constraints, we replace them with the unit norm constraint that requiring that the sum of the norms of the X size is N, but this is just a problem we know how to solve, right? This maximizing quadratic form subject to the unit norm constraint. And this is just a maximum, uh, it's just given by the top eigenvector of A, uh, right? Corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, right? So this so far so good. And then an alternative formulation that is a good, a good excuse to introduce a notion of a sign Laplacian is that instead of minimizing the happy edges as we did here in our cluster, imagine that you want to minimize, you, you can set up a least squares problem that minimize the following quadratic form. So let's say we want to minimize the unhappy edges. So this is Xi minus Aij times Xj, just by the similar line of thought of happy and unhappy edges, this counts unhappiness. If you expand this term out, uh, you just get this. If you keep in mind that Aij are plus minus ones, and you do a little bit of algebra here and you, you group the terms and so on. Well, in a few extra steps, you, you, you can arrive, you can write this least squares problem as the minimization of a quadratic form where the matrix is just D bar minus A, where this D bar minus A has been defined in the literature as a sign graph Laplacian matrix, right? Where D bar is just the sum of the absolute values of the entries in A, because remember A here is sign, it's both positive and negative entries, right? So um, there hasn't been much work in the last decade in this area of sign clustering. Perhaps one of the earliest ones is by Kunejus et al. And I think some of you may know Kunejus. I think he visited the Oxford Stats uh, some time ago, um, or maybe the math department, I, I don't know. Uh, but they had a paper uh, about, about 2000, 
uh, 10, where essentially that's what they did. They solved the signed, uh, signed version of this two-way ratio cut problem via this sign Laplacian. So d bar minus a, as I said, these are diagonal matrix with the degrees on the diagonal, uh, some of the absolute values. Uh, you can show without too difficulty that this L bar is also a positive semi definite matrix. And then you can also define for this uh, sign case, the normalized analogs that you have in the usual unsigned inverted case. So this is just a random walk one, just identity minus D bar inverse times A, or the symmetric graph Laplacian that has a similar form that has been shown to be suitable uh, for skew degree distribution. And then they argued uh, more uh, you know, qu qu uh, qualitatively from the result they get that the top eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the sign Laplacian matrix has information about the structure of the network. Right? And maybe somewhat related to that is this uh, follow-up paper by uh, Indrajit Dillon and his group at uh, Texas Austin, where they defined um, they uh, defined a similar objective function. So you start by defining uh, cluster indicator sets. So for a given cluster, your cluster T, for example, you define an indicator vector, just a column vector that has zeros and ones. And for the positions corresponding to nodes that contain a cluster T, you place a one and you make a zero otherwise. Now, if you divide, if you uh, <clears throat> split your A matrix into A plus minus A minus, because that's how we, de we decompose it, then if you look at this quantity <clears throat> D plus minus A, well, this is just uh, this quantity, right? Then D plus minus A is nothing but the Laplacian of the positive subgraph plus A minus, which is a negative subgraph, right? And you ask yourself, okay, if you, I were to write the quadratic form in terms of this, what do, does it count? So if I look at X transpose LX, well, it measures the total weight of positive edges across clusters. So it's, if it's not immediate, that it, you know, it um, takes a couple of slides to show that this, uh, you can encode cut into graphs uh, in terms of this quadratic form involving the Laplacian. So this X transpose L plus will measure the total weight of positive edges that flow uh, across, uh, you know, outside of a cluster. And then X plus, uh, and then X transpose A minus X. Well, again, this will only be uh, measuring the total weight of negative edges with inside the cluster. So essentially in a nutshell, what they proposed uh, in their paper, this balanced ratio cut is that they, they had they had this uh, numer uh, numerator quantity that uh, is essentially maximize that you want to minimize you want to minimize this number of upsets right because this is upset right if you have positive edges across clusters that's an upset you want to minimize right negative edges within the cluster this is an upset you want to minimize so they just combine these two terms and then they normalized just again to promote staying away from trivially small clusters and then they uh, have ways to minimize this objective function so now. We want to propose something that uh, you know is along the same lines, but is more robust, can tolerate large values of k, and also give some uh, guarantees in terms of performance. So a slight detour that uh, was yes. Can question. I take a question. There, there's a question in the chat. Um, if you could show again the difference between a slow and a quick computation, I think that's maybe from one slide back. Uh, this one. Um, uh, sorry, what is the question? Yeah, I missed it when it was just asked, but. Um, Maria, I'll see the uh, I don't I'm know. trying to somehow I don't know. Oh, yeah, I, I, sure so I think that was from the quick one, but uh, it, it's fine now. Please, please go ahead because uh, I think it wasn't as important for the for the uh, flow of the talk. So that's good. But thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I can d discuss a bit at the end about this uh, aspects of, of uh, computations. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, the reason why people like spectral methods is that they're fast to compute, they're scalable, in particular when the network is very sparse. So uh, all of this method I'm going to show you here either rely on computing eigenvectors or generalized eigenvectors of matrices. And we know from numerical analysis that if you have a modified version of the power, uh, if, you, if you have the power method, right, at each iteration of the power method, you're essentially incurring a cost that is linear in the number of non-zero entries in the matrix. Right? But our matrix is the adjacency matrix, right? Non-zeros in this matrix are just edges in the graph, right? So essentially, to compute a few eigenvectors of a matrix, right? You only require uh, a few iterations, each of which cost on the order of M, number of edges in the matrix, right? Non-zeros. So in a lot of the world applications, some of which have millions or billions of nodes, Right, n can be large, right, millions or billions, but the number of edges is much, much smaller. Right, it's, so these graphs are extremely sparse graphs where the degrees may be almost constant, or you know, the order one over n or log n over n. So the idea is that these spectral methods 
people like them because they scale linearly in the number of edges. Right? So this is a general comment that I think will uh, apply to most particular method out there. Um, okay. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Okay, and um, right, so uh, moving forward, so just some intuition that the le led us to look at sign clustering uh, for what about to tell is that this problem in machine learning is called constrained clustering where people try to cluster graphs subject to some domain knowledge constraints. So in, in some applications, we have some side information that some pairs of nodes should or should not end up in the same cluster. So people in machine learning call them must link and cannot link constraints, right? So these are soft constraints, side information. So some years ago, we had this paper in stats where we proposed a general diagram problem for problem of constraint clustering. In a nutshell, we took the similarity graph that has only positive entries, combined it, combined it with the must link constraint because they encode the same concept, right? Uh, values for a pair of nodes i and j for which s is high and they have a mass link, it means they have to be close to, uh, apart. We let our other subgraph encode the cannot link constraint, and then we solve the general diagram problem. Um, we were able to solve it fast because both of these two methods were Laplacians, and then we were able to get very good image segmentation results subject to constraints. So if you look in this last picture here, we segmented the image subject to the constraint that all in this e, in this sub bigger sub pixel here, all pairs of pixels between, uh, so any pair of green pixels um, were encoded as a mass link constraint and any pair of pixels coming from different patches that had different colors, they were cannot link constraints, right? So let's see how we can apply some of that intuition for the sign clustering case. So if you're given an unsigned graph and adjacency matrix W, we said before that the cut in H between C and the complement of C is just given by the total sum of the weights of the edges leaving my cluster C right, where the volume is just the sum of the degrees, right? So in constraint clustering, uh, kind of have, having inspiration from there, uh, in our sign clustering problem, as we said before, we want to minimize two measures of badness in some sense. So we want to minimize this normalized cut in the positive subgraph because positive edges, they shouldn't lie in the cut, right? They would be unhappy if, if they lie in the cut. So this we want to minimize, right? However, if you write the same thing on the left-hand side here for negative for the negative subgraphs, well, those edges in the cut, they are happy edges, and I want to max to, to maximize them, right? If I take the minus, if I took the, to the power minus one, then this is something I also want to minimize. So I want to find the cluster assignment that simultaneously drives down these two quantities, right? So ideally we want C and 11, 10 and 11 to be small. And what about if we think of a hack and we merge these two objectives 10 and 11 with some trade of parameter here, tau plus and tau minus. Right, so I take the numerators from each one, I combine them with the tau, tau uh, minus, and I take the denominator, I combine it with the tau plus, and you can think of this as some sort of trade-off regularization parameters. And this has also natural extensions to more than uh, uh, two clusters. Uh, you can write the same thing for more than two clusters, and we define something similar analog to what you've seen before in terms of a cluster indicated vector. So for a given cluster CI, if a node J doesn't belong to it, I put a zero. If it does belong to it, Instead of putting one, we put this ugly quantity here just for mathematical convenience. And then we can rephrase this optimization problem here in 13 as uh, the same problem, but in terms of cuts. So I replace cut and volumes by just quadratic forms, right? So this is a quadratic form in L plus plus tau minus D minus. And then this is the quadratic form in L minus plus tau plus times D plus, right? And this L plus and L minus, again, just a Laplacian of the positive and negative subgraphs, and then D plus and D minus are just diagonal matrices with the degrees of G respective to G minus. Okay, now again, this is unfortunately an empty hard problem because of the discreteness constraints, the kind of zero one constraints. So we relax them, we allow each indicator vector, each column indicator vector not to be, not force it to be, you know, zero and one, but let, let it roam free in, in RN. We define this new set of vectors Z1 to uh, um, uh, ZK. Uh, so this should be in, um, uh, yeah, so to, to, to the K corresponding to the clusters in Rn. And then we want them to be also, um, also normal with respect to this uh, uh, L minus, shifted L minus, right? So me meaning if Zi and Zj, uh, are, if I and J are the same, then this quadratic form is one. Whenever I and J are not the same, then this quadratic form is, is zero. We you know, plug this back in into our objective function that I've seen on the previous slide. Okay, so far so good. And then basically what I'm trying to say here that we did this uh, sort of relaxation here by replacing our vectors, earlier vectors with our Z vectors uh, and requiring them to be, you know, L minus plus tau plus D plus or, uh, orthonormal. 
it's not quite a relaxation of 15. So it's not a relaxation in the sense that I'm dropping some constraints and then I'm enlarging my constraint set. But however, it leads to a suitable eigenvalue problem that we know how to solve well and it works very well in practice. So you have to make some more assumptions here that this shifted matrix here is, uh, is full rank. And then if you, if you do an appropriate change in variables and it, it takes a few slides to, to properly write this out, if you replace this to change a variable, and you translate in this new variable y the orthonormality constraints from before, lo and behold, we just arrive at this minimization problem that involved, uh, it's a, it's a, it, that involves minimizing the trace of this quadratic form, y transpose, times this ugly matrix, long matrix t in blue. Let's call this matrix t from now on. Right, so we try to minimize this quadratic form. And this problem, subject to the constraint that y transpose y is one. So remember, y is a very tall matrix of size n by k. Yeah? And uh, right, so for those of you who've seen sort of derivation of PCA, it's very much along the, those lines. And we know how to solve this problem, right? We just, uh, um, we, it, this just can be solved by finding the bottom eigenvectors of this uh, tall matrix here, of this matrix here T. Okay, so the algorithm in a nutshell is extremely simple. You give me a matrix G, I split it into G plus and G minus, the positive and sub negative subgraphs. And I find the smallest K generalized eigenvectors of L plus and L minus. Uh, the shifted versions for some suitably chosen shift parameters, right? And then I get the embedding and then I cluster and I get my clusters using my favorite k-means plus plus. And we can do the same thing using a regularized version, a symmetrized version of, of sponge. So we call this sponge. We had a couple of interns worked on this uh, uh, project and they came up with a nickname. So it stands for signed positive over negative generalized eigenvalue problem. So it worked out nice. And uh, in very large experiments, we use something that's called log PCG. It's a preconditioned eigen solver, just so we can solve large scale positive term definite matrices, right? So the, the catch here is that both matrices, uh, L plus and L minus shifted versions of them, they were both uh, PSD matrices, positive term, term definite matrices. And because of this, uh, people know how to solve uh, this type of eigen, uh, eigen systems extremely fast. Like uh, it's building on some breakthroughs people in computer science had in the mid 2000 in terms of uh, Laplace linear system solver. So in, in a nutshell, they can solve Laplace linear systems of the form LX equals to B where L is a Laplacian matrix in a uh, number that's almost linear in the number of edges of the graph. So typically you need order N squared to invert the matrix L or compute to the inverse. But if, if, if it's a Laplacian, then you can do it in uh, linear time and the number of non zeros in the matrix. Okay, so uh, what's the stochastic block model for this that you can uh, potentially think to experiment with give guarantees? Imagine that you have a graph G, you split it into K clusters and for each edge in the same cluster, you assign it a plus one in the noiseless case. And then if they're in different clusters, you put a minus, a minus one because that's where it should belong. And then with some probability eta, uh, less than one half, you just flip the sign. So the measurement model is with probability one minus P, the edge is missing with probability eta times P it's present, but it's corrupt, right? Remember I and J are the same cluster, right? So they should be plus one in the noiseless case, but with probability eta, you flip that edge and with the main probability it's correct. And you do the same thing for when I and J lie in different clusters, right? Uh, so this is a, a natural generalization of the stochastic block model to the sign case. And it allows us to, to uh, give some performance guarantees for sponge in the setting for k equal to two, which we later extended for larger k and also uneven number of clusters. So in terms of the robustness, the idea is that you look at, remember we have this very ugly matrix T, right? We denote by T bar, it's kind of expected counterpart where you replace some, each of the quantities there with their expectations. And then for simplicity, let's say you focus on the case k equal to two, right? And let's say for uh, easiness, the, plastic, the planted clusters are, one to n minus one is C1, the rest is C2. So basically uh, our, one of the eigenvectors we'll be looking for will be of this form where it, it will have plus ones for the first n minus two values, minus one for the remaining uh, n over two, right? And if we let V2 of T and V2 of T bar be two tall matrices of size n by two that contain the eigenvectors corresponding to the smallest two eigenvectors of T and T bar, then what you can show using tools from uh, matrix perturbation theory, random matrix theory in particular, like Davis Cahan type kind of bounds, is that the range space of V2 T is close to that of V2 T bar with high probability, provided N and P are large enough. Okay, so what are some, uh, how does it work in practice? Right? Can, so can you, I yes. ask about that previous slide? So I didn't yes. quite understand what T bar is doing. It's taking the expectation. T bar, think of it as, 
it's taking the uh, member wise expectation of each entry here, of each matrix in here, because you know we have a probabilistic model yes. for A, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can write down similar probabilistic model for D and for D minus and for D plus and for L okay. plus and for L minus. And you can all write plug plug them in, and then you, you get your uh, kind of think of T bar as kind of the expected counterpart of, of T. Okay. And the result regarding T and T bar is the range. Yeah, is that the column space of these two tall matrices of V2 is the top twigen vectors of T, the ground truth matrix, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And the same thing for the top twigen vectors of T bar is that these two eigenspaces align well, provided N and P are large enough. So if we have enough edges and N is large enough and the noise level is not too large, then the range space of this two of, of T will be the same thing as that of T bar. Okay. And this is useful because that's where you get your clusters at the very end. You run k means in this eigen embedding, right? So mm -hmm. of course you, you get this up to orthogonal transformation, but you don't care if you run k means on on an embedding. If it's uh, pro, you know randomly rotated, k means will give you the same result, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay. So mm -hmm. how does this work in practice, right? So if you put a, a stochastic block model with five clusters and a very sparse probability, let's say 0.1%. So you compare a bunch of methods. So the recovery score here is the, what we call the RAND index. So the higher, the better, right? So if you, uh, right, so here on the x-axis, I vary the flip probability, the noise level versus the recovery score. Then our methods, which is which are sponge and sponge sim, already perform quite well. And this is a sim in, in figure B here. It's the same setting, except I have K to be 50 clusters and uh, P to be slightly higher. So that's, you know, P is the edge density and eta is the flip probability, right, if you recall. But already in this two examples, we see that these two methods already do quite well. But the change is even more dramatic if you make this problem even harder, meaning when K is very large, let's say we fix the noise level and then we vary the edge probability. So we see that for very large probabilities, so for very, very sparse graphs, these methods, they really struggle, right? They, they do not do well. And then if we have you know K equal to uh, 20, for example, and P is 1%, then they cannot tolerate too much noise. So this is our method at uh, the, the top and all the others here have basically ran the index close to zero, the complete garbage results returned while our method are still able to return even close to one RAND index, okay? And with some quick applications that we've looked at before, we've looked at clustering the empirical correlation matrix of S&P 1500 time series data. So those are stocks in the S&P 1500 index. We looked at daily returns. We build a correlation matrix over 15, 20 year period. We looked at the bottom 10 eigenvectors of the of the Laplacian, but in this case, just just L bar, the standard sign Laplacian, and and, and um, you know when we ran uh, k means into this uh, embedding, and then we can see here that the way you read this chart, that on the x-axis, these are very known, these are well-known sector membership of the stocks, and then the columns are the different clusters that we received, that we recovered, right? So you can see here um, how well the, our recovered clusters align with this known market sector. So you see energy is all concentrated into cluster number six, right? And then, uh, you know, utility is also in number number five concentrated, but some other, uh, um, you know, sectors are very well, are pretty much spread out across the cluster that we recover. Right? And then one advantage of our method compared to the others is that they cannot tolerate very large number of clusters. So if you try, so this is our, our two methods, right? And this was uh, BNC and LSIM. Well, uh, the top is K equal to 10 at the bottom is 30 clusters. Like B and C for 30 clusters is not going to give you anything meaningful. So just give you two clusters uh, that are reasonable size and one cluster that gets completely huge. It just takes over everything. This is that one really capture. While well, our two methods, they really are capture the structure. So, so here in these heat maps, blue means plus one, positive correlation, and red means negative one, right? Close to negative one, right? So these are, I'm just reshuffling here, showing the heat maps of reordered correlation matrices. Okay, so, so in terms of regularization, so um, in the usual unsigned case, it was noticed that if you do regularization, uh, it will help improve the performance of your method. So, uh, so what I mean is that in the very sparse regime, so think of the sparse regime where P, the probability of an edge is on the order theta one over N. So it's on the order one over N. So well below the log N over N that we're used to. So this is what people refer to the sparse regime. And there's typically two ways people regularize. They either, when they build a diagonal matrix, they shift the diagonal matrix D by a scalar times identity. 
that's option one. The other option by Joseph and you being you in 2016, they literally shifted by scalar times to all ones matrix. So this is just outer product of the one sector with itself. So I'm just shifting all the entries. I'm adding a bit of weight to all the pairs in, in the graph. So not, you know, not just existing edges, but to everyone, including self, self loops. So if you sort of translate this to the sign case, well, you can imagine that just as we decomposed earlier A into A plus and A minus, then we can um, propose regularized version for A plus and A minus. So we regularized A plus like that, we regularized A minus like that. And then we proceed basis as usual by defining, for example, our uh, symmetric sign Laplacian that we've seen earlier. But instead of using A, we're going to use uh, A tau, which is just the sum of this to a plus and a minus is all right. So these are you know the regularized version counterparts of what we have seen earlier, right? And you can do the same thing for the sponge algorithm, but it, it takes a bit more to, uh, to to flesh out. But what what are the benefits? If we look empirically, what are the benefits of doing this? So remember, tau plus and tau minus are our regularization parameter, tau plus and tau minus, right? Okay. So here is a heat map varying tau plus and tau minus, and then showing the adjusted rand index recovery score. Uh, in the case of a stochastic block model with 5,000 nodes and five clusters. So you can see here that for a properly, you know, properly chosen tau plus and tau minus, and again, this, these parameters have to be tuned, then you do get uh, increase in performance, right? So you can get error, it's quite a broad range, right? So if you can go from you know, close to nothing recovery uh, or 0 0.1 to all the way to 0.5 and 0.6 in terms of RAND index. So clearly this regularization um, uh, helps quite a bit. Now. An additional extension that we've, we've thought of recently is that is this, this idea of polarization in sign graphs. So there's been some works in the literature very recently that have looked for uh, this phenomenon of polarization in signed networks. So the idea there is that you, know, you want to find subgraphs uh, planted in a much bigger graph where the population can be separated very well into two antagonistic subgroups. And they claim this is important because it's, uh, you, know, you have to identify these communities. They're, harmful to the democratization process and, and so on. So what would that mean in, in our setting is that, so here I'm showing just a standard SBA model, no noise, little noise, a lot of noise, right? In the, plug, uh, in the main diagonal, I have plus ones. That's where the plus one should belong within clusters. The cross is minus one, right? And those are just different levels of noise of uh, heat maps of the JCNC matrix. But then if you're doing a, uh, in, a in a polarized model, essentially each community, it's an SSBM, it's a sign stochastic block model with K equal to two, because I just have two communities in each, in each community, I have two subclusters, right? Uh, left and right, if you, if you think, and then you're chaining them into a big network. And then this can be seen as a, as a polarized model for SSBM, right? But, uh, right, so this is what I said earlier, but in practice, what I think it would be important to be able to design methods to, to handle is this idea of a planted polarized SSBM where this, planted cluster that you're looking for are only a very small portion of the ambient graph, right? So here we have these four cluster, four communities that are polarized, that are planted, and then the rest of the graph is completely noise, right? So there's a difference here be between the standard SSBM and the polarized one, because here off diagonal entries still have signal in them, they're mostly minus ones, while here off the block diagonals is garbage, we cannot say anything, right? And, um, so maybe in the in the last uh, the second half or maybe 25 minutes 20 minutes or so uh, I'll try to say a little bit about uh, clustering in directed networks. So one motivation for this was coming from again lead lag in, in time series examples and if I have time later on I'll discuss. But another one was coming from finding anomalies in transaction networks. So imagine that you have a big network and people are wiring money uh, to, to each other. And imagine that you have some sort of drug cartel that uh, are sending money to each other and you would like to find a structure such that the low level nodes here, one, two, three, four, send most a lot of, of, of payments to nodes five and six. Then five and six, they, yes, question? It's, um, it's not on to Okay, yeah, maybe just bang on noise. Right, so, uh, so the way you read this plot is uh, uh, black arrows, they denote transactions that are outside of the structure we're looking for, and green transactions, are the, the structure we'll, we are looking for. In other words, if I take node, let's say one and six, the way you read this is there's, if I look at the payments between one and six, then 90% of them flow from one to six and only 10% the other way around. 
right? So think, think, think of whenever you see a pair uh, of uh, uh, green and black, green says the majority of the flow goes from one to six and the minority goes the other way around, right? And if we're given a network like this, ideally, we like to, to find these nodes here that are part of this scheme, right? And of course, these people may also transact money, small amounts to each other. So it's not like this green structure will be visible only from looking at the support of the graph, meaning edge is present or missing. Like, so we, we cannot extract this underlying cluster just based on density alone, right? You have to look, take direction into account, right? And of course they would send money to each other, but most importantly, they will all, all the players, all these market participants in this cartel, they will also send trade money. They will also send and receive from the rest of the world from, from payments, right? So the goal is, can we uncover this? And the problem, yeah, the, the goal is, can we uncover the structure in this much bigger ambient planted graph? And the problem is that typically the ambient graph, the rest of the world graph, is much, much bigger than the structure that we're looking for, okay? So this was part of the motivation. So if, if we go look at uh, directed graphs for a little bit, some challenges that arise when handling these directed graphs are the fact that the usual normalized cut values, similar to what we've seen earlier based on edge density, they will not work. They'll just simply fail to uncover some of the underlying patterns that we're looking for. And the idea here is that some of the asymmetric relationships as we've seen in the previous uh, pictures, they contain important information about the structure of the graph. So some methods, they do something that's akin to a naive symmetrization of the adjacency matrix. So you can take your matrix M, you add the transpose to it, you make it symmetric, and then you can apply off the shelf al algorithm that work for symmetric matrices. Let me show you an example where just this naive symmetrization will not give us any new information that we do not know. So let's, uh, the, the example I'm gonna show, it's, uh, it's this US migration data set that has about 3000 nodes and entry IJ encodes the number of people that migrated from county I to county J in the US during a five year period. Yes, yeah, this is US census data, right? So uh, the, the claim here is that this migration flows, they will be lost uh, if we just do like a naive symmetrization. So if I just do the naive symmetrization, then I cluster my matrix, the clusters I, 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 I obtain align pretty well with political and state boundaries. But this is not surprised. I mean, there's the intrastate migration. That's the main, you know, driving component of the process. And there's very little, you know, intra interstate migration, right? However, if we do the algorithm that I will uh, show you in a little bit in terms of this uh, Hermitian clustering, the clustering structure look, look, looks like this, yeah? But what is most important is that if, let's say I recovered K clusters, so I have K choose two pairs of clusters. Now suppose that uh, I look at the pair of clusters that exhibits the largest imbalance in the flow, like uh, in, in the sense that, you know, there's a big imbalance in the direction of the edges. So if I just, you know, only focus on the, uh, the green and red clusters, make everything else yellow, then our Hermitian clustering algorithm, this top pair, we, we actually highlight this structural uh, property of the graph that you have a lot of migration flowing from uh, green states to red states. You know, more like you know Florida and uh, you know South East US to the Northeast Coast, right? And this type of structure is what we are, are, are after. So what's the algorithm? Well, the algorithm is inversely, immersingly simple. You give me a matrix M. If it's not skew symmetric, meaning if you allow to have flows from I to J and also from J to I, then I just take the net difference, right? To just uh, have a single edge, but then I multiply it by the imaginary number. Right, this Hermitian matrix A, it's a Hermitian matrix, it has real eigenvalues. And what we could show is that whenever the direction of the edges uh, induce a certain cluster structure on the graph, and I'll show uh, directly stochastic block model in, in, in a bit, then this structure is, is roughly encoded in the eigenvectors of the extremal eigenvectors of this matrix A. And in, in particular, uh, if you look at the pairs of clusters that come out of your clustering algorithm, uh, then they will exhibit a large imbalance in terms of the flow. Right, so you can argue that this type of Hermitian clustering algorithms uncover what are called these days like higher order structure between the clusters. So we move beyond pairwise interactions between nodes and we're able to extract uh, interactions between, uh, be between clusters. So what's a natural direct stochastic block model in this setting? Well, we have K clusters or communities potentially of different size. We have a probability P of an edge existing between two vertices in the same cluster and Q of edges existing between two vertices in different clusters. But to make the problem in the hardest scenario, we want to set P equal to Q in the setting, because remember, we don't want to cheat. If P is much different than Q, 
I can just throw away the directions on the edges and I run your favorite community text and classing algorithm and you'll find it, right? And the catch here, the important comp component is that there's an underlying matrix F, a size K by K, that encodes the orientation of the edges between the clusters. So let's say uh, F I F L J plus F J L should sum up to one, right? So I want 80, you know, most 80% of the flow to flow from cluster one to cluster two, and then only 20% the other way around. So this ensemble here, um, we denoted by this, uh, this this model here, and then you can think of this matrix F as representing the meta graph that describe the relations be between the clusters. So what is a concrete example? So let, let's say we have K equal to three clusters, C1, C2, C3, and the meta flow matrix is the following. Within each cluster on the diagonal, edges are oriented at random. So you know, if you give me pair I, J in the same cluster, 50% I flows to J, 50% J flows to I, no structure. But if you give me uh, two nodes I and J from two different clusters from C1 and C2, then 25% of the edges will flow from cluster one to cluster two and 75% from cluster two to cluster one. So this imbalance here, that it is captured, captured in this metagraph. So the metagraph here is basically this, uh, this cycle here. And this is a good example because um, in expectation, all the vertices in our graph G, they have the same in and out degree. So there's no sort of cheating that you can do and just cluster or, or find the clusters based on in and out degree, okay? And uh, so what's the algorithm, right? So we, we're building this Hermitian matrix A. Uh, we may choose to normalize it in the spirit of uh, previous uh, normalized uh, Laplacians in the, in the literature in the, in the unsigned sign case. We compute the top eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, and then we apply K means to the resulting eigen embedding, and then that's how we get the clusters. And uh, what we could show is that for, you know, very large, for general uh, metagraph matrix, we're able to upper bound the number of misclassified vertices. So basically, if you run k-means, you get back your solution. And uh, basically, this gives us the number of vertices that we have misclassified. So think of uh, you know, the error that we make in our clustering techniques. And, and again, this is again based on the fact that the eigenspaces of this A matrix, the ground truth one and the one that we see in the real data are not too different apart. right? And then you can use some off-the-shelf techniques to, uh, to take that as, as input and then uh, plug into a k-means uh, pipeline and then uh, get back this, this clustering rate, okay? Now what's some intuition? Why, why does this work so particularly well, as you will see? Well, previous spectral methods that either let have symmetrized the matrix, so this is another way to symmetrize the matrix. You can look at M transpose M or MM transpose, right? So you make a symmetric matrix, but essentially what this count, they count number of parents, children and com uh, sorry, common parents and common children or both, right? That's what other methods have done. But if you think of this matrix that we're proposing, if you actually look, consider it square because A and A square, we have the same eigenvectors and uh, it's easier to interpret. If you write it down, then this A square, what exactly it will count, it will count the number of common parents and common children minus the number of mismatch relationships. So like three people. So, you know, uh, you know, Carol is a mismatch with respect to me and Rodrigo. If, for example, I point to Carol and Carol points to Rodrigo, if you think of this directed graph in terms of matches, right? If I'm beaten by Carol, then Carol is beaten by Rodrigo, right? So there's no commonality in terms of the pattern of people we beat or, or you know, win or lose to, okay? So in some sense, this A matrix implicitly keeps track of both common parents and common children, and also without the need to, without the need to perform this expensive matrix operation like these other methods uh, do. And then you can also take this uh, uh, Hermitian matrices and then you can normalize them. So you can do like D inverse A, which looks very similar to the normalized uh, Laplacian we've seen earlier, or you can uh, build a symmetrized version of it. And then if you were to look at some of the eigen, some of the spectra of these matrices, Herm random walk or Herm sim, this is what it will look like. For this, this is like a, the underlying metagraph is just a cycle, a C4. And then if you look at the uh, eigenvalues, of uh, this uh, Hermitian matrices, you will see the bulk of the eigenvalues, and then you're going to see uh, four large eigenvalues popping outside of the same circle. And then you see the same thing if you have a, a complete metagraph. So we take this, you know, the embedding, and the natural is given by the eigenvectors corresponding to this bottom two and largest two uh, eigenvalues. Um, so, um, in the inter interest of time, I'm <clears throat> not going to de detail this too much, but there's this uh, algorithm uh, called DISC by uh, Bin Yun in her lab that essentially we, that we compare to. And essentially what they do, they take this adjacency matrix and then they normalize it by the uh, in and out degree of the nodes with some regularization terms. So think of this as just the usual Laplacian, 
but it's regularized where this regularization parameter tau is applied to both the in degree and out degree. So instead of having our usual D matrix, right, that we have in the usual Laplacian co construction, we have two matrices, O and P, which are diagonal matrices, where they can code the in degree and out degree with some regularization, right? And, uh, and then they compute an SVD of this matrix, and then uh, they cluster the left singular vectors, the right singular vectors, and then they, uh, or they combine the two set of singular vectors and, and cluster, and then that's how they get the, the, the clustering. One advantage of their method is that A did not be skew symmetric, which our method does require. And if we, if we look how we compare it against this method, so DISG is what I mentioned earlier, different variations of it, by sim and DD sim, they are just symmetrized versions of the matrix. So people have proposed uh, some years ago, uh, various symmetrizations for these directed matrices. And then if we look under this directed stochastic block model, right? So we have K clusters, 5,000 nodes, 0.5% uh, sparsity level, right? And then if we increase the noise level eta, so here the noise level is says it's controlling the flow in, in our uh, DSBM model. So if we go to this um, example here, right? Then eta would be 25% because, you know, the meta graph tells me I should see a flow from two to one, right? So in the clean perfect case, 100% of the edges should flow from C2 to C1. That's what the edge points out, right? But in practice, in, in this uh, stochastic block model, instead of putting one here, we put 0 0.75, so like one minus eta, right? So eta here is 0.25. So you can think of eta as the noise level, right? So of course, eta is zero, it's, it's ideal. If eta is 50%, then I'm gonna have here 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, and I'm not gonna be able to, of course, to recover. I've killed all the, all the structure, right? So if we look at some, to, to compare this uh, adjusted rand index, first we vary the noise level, and we can see that we are already, our, these two methods based on the Hermitian matrix or so the random walk Hermitian matrix already dominate everyone else, okay, by, by quite a bit. And the, the change again is even more dramatic if we go to the setting where the graphs are very sparse. So this is a 0.02% uh, uh, and then uh, K is very large. So if, if, we, if we seek to find 50 clusters in our graph, uh, and P is like 2% and 1%, then the gap is even bigger. So it, at a very sparse graph at 1% edges present, 50 clusters, then basically everybody else returns under 0.1 rand index while we return 0.6 and 0.7, okay? So uh, one uh, application to, to, to this into, uh, for this migration data set is that we're able to uncover clusters that exhibit a high imbalance flow. So just to make this a bit more formal, let's say if you give me a pair of clusters X and Y, I define the cut and balance ratio C sub i to be, just, to be given by the weight of the vertex it's flowing from x to y divided by the weight from x to y plus the weight from y to x, right? So it's, an, it's a number between zero and one. And the point is we want to find clusters for which this imbalance is close to zero or close to one. In other words, you know, far away from 0 0.5. 0 .5, 0 0.5 is boring, no, no structure, right? And then if you recall on the second or third slide when we, I reminded about the 20 year old normalized cut uh, from spectral clustering, they are also doing some penalization there. Remember you had the cut divided by the volume, right? In this setting here to penalize for uh, small clusters, we want to, let's say we take our clustering balance. We want to be far away from 0 0.5, yeah? And we also penalize by either the size of the, the two clusters or by the minimum of the volume of the two clusters, where the volume of a cluster is just the so total sum of the in and out degrees. The only point for these two normalizations is just to stay away from trivially sized clusters, right? Because they're not, not really insightful for us. So if we go back to this US migration data set, uh, this method uh, that we're compared against, you were able to, let's say, we focus on the, on the top largest uh, imbalance pair. So they find many clusters. We find the pair of the clusters. Fi we find the pair of clusters for which they exhibit the highest imbalance. So that's 16%. Yeah. So 16% of the edges flow from, uh, I think here is from uh, red to blue and 84% the other way around. While if we look at our two methods, then you know the flow is like 8% one way and 92% the other way. And then for this random walk admission is 90% one way and 81 the other way. But the, the improvement is much bigger if we start taking into account this penalization. So if we penalize by the minimum of the sizes of the clusters or the volumes, because you can see here, this red cluster in here is not very, it's very small and very spread out. It's not very insightful. We don't, we want to stay away from small clusters. Then if you look at the objective functions where you penalize by either the size or the volume 
So the size is on the left, the volume is on the right. Then these numbers here in the purple rectangles are much higher than what these other methods are, uh, re are recovering. So um, I don't think I'm going to have time to, to um, discuss any applications of this to ranking, but I'll just um, <clears throat> maybe give a bit of intuition. Uh, in the, so I have about five, five minutes. Yes, five okay. minutes. Or, okay, right. So, yes, so in, right. So in 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 ranking, I'll just say how this relates to ranking, right? So typically in ranking problems, uh, what is the goal? We're given data with that uh, match outcomes. You know, pe people playing games, and you have uh, ordinal comparisons. Player I beats player J, or you have the score of the match. And the goal is, can we find a partial ranking ranking of the end players? That best agrees with the given data, and this best can be quantified in terms of the number of upsets, right? If Manchester United plays Chelsea and beats Chelsea in the direct match, but in the final ranking Chelsea is ranked higher than Manchester, that's an upset, right? And the goal is you give me the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, match matrix, which can be encoded as a directed graph, by the way, as we've talked earlier. And the goal is I want to give you an ordering of the players, an ordering of the of the players that uh, minimize the number of upsets. Right, so you can think of the simple probabilistic model is that you have R1 to Rn, which are like ground truth rankings or strength of the players. And the measurement that you see available is just a proxy for the strength difference Ri minus Rj, right? And in a lot of real applications, our measurement matrix is very incomplete, especially like N in large, not everyone plays with everyone. And it's also very noisy and inconsistent. So, you know, if you have that a tournament, you can be that A bits B, B bits C, and C bits A, but uh, right. So you're gonna you're gonna have this inconsistency no, no matter what. So a simple model that one can consider is, you know, with some probability you have a missing edge. With some probability you actually you have a correct edge, meaning you really measure R M minus R J, you know, the difference in the skill set. And then with some remaining noise probability, you just have some complete measurement. Uh, it's a complete garbage measurement that is completely not uh, not informative. Okay, so in ranking problems, the input is a directed graph, and I want to find the one dimensional ordering of the players that best agrees with the given data. So I think some of the method that we discussed, so I'm not going to um, talk too much about this uh, ranking because there's, there's not much time, but I can, there's one paper if you like to, to, to re, um, learn more about ranking in networks, there's this paper by Katerina Debaco and all from a couple of years ago where they compare about 10 methods, including uh, sync rank, so it's a method I've worked on a couple of uh, some time ago. And, um, and they also have implementations in Python, MATLAB in R. So it's quite a really in insightful uh, re uh, resource. So now back to the, and I'll, like, like I'll finish. Um, I'm not gonna have time. So I'll, I'll just finish with why is this, uh, why is it useful to uncover this um, clusters in the in directed graphs. So first of all, it, it can well be the case that uh, you can exploit this for time series problems. So in many applications, you, you, the data given as input is time series data. And this time series, they are they exhibit lead lag relationships, right? So you can choose your favorite lead lag measure, right? And then you can, for every pair of time series, so you have a graph on n nodes corresponding to n time series that could be financial stocks, for example, an entry ij is a directed edge from i to j if i leads or lags time series j. And you can, you're free to choose your whatever measure of lead lag depends on that we've used and with some ongoing work with exploring various options here. But the point is you start as input as time series and you build a directed graph where entry ij is a proxy for whether i leads or lags time series j, right? And then what can you do with it, right? So in a lot of these applications, um, when you you know when you talk to people who are not outside of networks, you, you know, you tell them about clustering, commit detection, but you very often I've got the question, you know, the so what question. So you okay, you find these communities and clusters, like what can you do with them? So I, I think as a community, it'd be good if there'll be more and more problems taking this uh, application one step farther, finding clusters, finding communities, and then exploiting them, leveraging that uncover structure for some concrete task, like a prediction task or classification and so on. So for example, if you're given, you know, if you if you're given time series and you construct a directed network, if you have a ranking algorithm that can uncover the network, that, that can um, so you build a directed network, you run your favorite ranking algorithm, you can sort the time series from most leading to the most lagging. Right. And you can make a prediction out of it by saying, okay, I'm gonna uh, cluster my uh, 
graph into leaders and laggards, and I'm, I'm going to make a prediction that the laggards will catch up to the lead, lead leaders tomorrow. So that's one potential variant. Another one is that it's very unlikely for, uh, you know, if you look at the S&P 500 market, it's very unlikely that there exists a very single global ordering of the stock market into one, and I can globally sort all the stocks in the market from most feeding to most lagging. What's not naturally to happen is that there exist clusters such that within each cluster, I can sort from lead to lag within uh, with higher accuracy. So kind of a stochastic block model would be, I have three clusters. Within each cluster, whenever I measure my R minus RJ skill offset, I add some noise eta one. And then whenever I compare two players from different clusters, then I add some noise eta two, with eta two being much, much bigger than eta one. Right, so the goal is if I give you an instance of this type of stochastic block model for ranking, can you uncover the, 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 the cluster? So it's not just doing clustering, right? Because there's no edge density differences here. So it's, you have to simultaneously do clustering and, and ranking. Maybe I'll, I'll end with, um, you know, what can this uh, sort of Hermitian based clustering uncover? So if you, if you give us, if you give me a directed graph, then by, by uh, running this type of analysis, we can decompose the big graph into, into clusters such that like in here, maybe cluster one uh, leads cluster two and then cluster two leads cluster three. So this is a connected component of its own. Maybe I have another separate component where uh, I have cluster eight leading seven and nine leading seven and seven lead six. So I'm able to uncover this you know, clusters of lead lag relationships. And the problem is that most often these clusters are planted in a much, much bigger ambient graph. Like, you know, most of it can be the case that 98% of the nodes in the graph have no structure associated to, to them, no structure with respect to ranking, lead lag or whatever, and makes the problem much, much harder, right? And finally, maybe it's the one good reason to think about sort of graph neural networks uh, as, as, as uh, you know, tools to cluster and find embeddings of the signed and directed graphs is that a lot of these uh, data problems, you don't just have the network, but you also have some no-level covariance information. So these were stocks, for example, you don't just see the relationship between lead lag between the stocks, but you also see some properties of the stock. Maybe what's the volume, what, 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 uh, you know, what market and sector they come from, or whatever other no-level features you might have associated with your, with your data. So in, in, in summary, um, hopefully managed to convince you that spectral methods are an appealing tool for the sort of problem that we've considered here, in particular clustering rank, uh, signed and directed graphs and, and ranking. They uh, can be robust to high levels of noise in the data, especially in the low SNR regime, if you consider the appropriate uh, you know, matrix operators and the appropriate regularization. And you can also give some guarantees under suitably defined stochastic block models. So what's next? Well, how do you formalize this notion of directed communities beyond stochastic block models? Uh, maybe how to combine patterns in edge directions with different edge densities. Uh, so far, we've assumed edge density is the same everywhere. What are extensions to the time-dependent setting? What are good probabilistic models to, to track temporal changes in the network? How do we do change point detection for network time series data, in particular signed and directed? But it's, it's a difficult problem also because it's not much ground truth real data out there with, with uh, you know, ground truth to, uh, um, change points. How do you design good regularization techniques for signed and directed graphs? So we know how to do it for signed, not clear at this point, how to do it for directed. Maybe how, what are some extensions to hypergraphs and, and higher order structures? We started to look at graph neural networks uh, for signed and directed graphs. And uh, so we can also account for some potential no level covariate information when you find the, uh, uh, the clusters. And, uh, and uh, looking at some applications to finance and cybersecurity in terms of uh, prediction in time series based on this lead lag detection in time series and also normal detection. So I think I'll uh, stop here in a couple of minutes all the time. Sorry about that. Thanks a lot, Mihai. Um, yeah, indeed. So it's, it's a bit past three now. So maybe some people have to go, but I think we can still take yeah, one or two questions. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around. To stick around. So um, in any case, thanks a lot. Um, and if, if there's a question, you can raise your hand or, or type in the chat or just uh, unmute. Okay, so Gizina is here. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah thank you, Miha. It's a very interesting talk. There's a question which I probably should have asked you earlier. Um, yes. so, so, um, so it's about testing. So testing whether uh, sort of the, uh, the results are significant in any way. So the clustering that you, I mean, that's a big problem in community detection. Is there anything known in, um, in spectral clustering which you could use? Not, not really, not from what I've seen. I remember I, I've seen something 
in terms of testing for, for ranking. So this paper that I flashed earlier by Katerina Dibaco and uh, mm -hmm. Chris Moore, they use it for, for ranking. And then there, they were able to also propose, you know, ranking along with the, with the p-value. So how statistically significant is that ranking? But that's what's based on permutation tests. Okay. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah, not nothing that I've I've seen. That, yeah, there could be, but I'm not not aware of. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense to 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 do that, especially in the high noise regime, because. If you have a lot, of, yeah, a lot of noise in the data, I mean, you're running clustering, you just will give you a cluster no matter what. Uh, but the question is, yes, how so this significant that cluster is or that lead lag relationship is? It's, it's um, yeah, it's another question. So, thanks. Sure. <clears throat> I see Alexander also has raised his hand. Yes. Uh, hi. Yeah. So, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. I was just, uh, Wondering about the, the the method with the with the Hermitian uh, matrix for um, yes for for direct uh, network. Did you also uh, test it or, or or tried it on on networks that are not uh, really uh, strongly connected? Like the, so, like for example, the uh, networks with uh, uh, with a direct core periphery st structure. Uh, does would would they also work well in this case? So. So not so in the initial paper we didn't test we just looked at some US migration data some political blogs, um, but in terms of this particular structure I think this is what we discussed for the telegram telegraph data set right that you've shared with us for yeah. Yeah, um, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> so we've we've played with that a bit more in another very recent project that I think it would there'll be a paper coming out soon on the archive, uh, maybe in, in, in a week or two, but it's using different types of methods and we're also comparing the results on that, um, yeah, on that problem. But yeah, we, we haven't explicitly designed like a, an SBM model where you exactly, do, you, you, you lack this strong connectivity. So we didn't look specifically to see how that would, would impact. But I know that some other methods out there, they specifically rely on this. Uh, on on this uh, yeah on the on the underlying directed graph to be strongly connected. Yeah. Okay. I, can I can I say something? So yes, I have yes, seen yes. like some of the methods they, uh, if they use like random work normalization, they do require something uh, the underlying graph to be strongly connected. But if people use like page rank normalization, then they can uh, remove this uh, restriction. Um, the experiments we conducted or. I wrote uh, are based on some weakly connected uh, networks. So not necessarily strongly connected because some of the networks, they are really sparse. Yeah, and that's it. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Rodrigo, I think you have your hand up or it's from earlier. I do. Uh, so I'm asking on behalf of somebody who posted a direct message, had to go. Um, yeah. It's really quickly, could you give an intuition of why the Hermitian matrix uh, you build as M minus M transpose times E. I guess uh, you explain why take the difference and that's cheaper, et cetera, but why take the times uh, I? Ah, so this goes back to... <clears throat> why, I guess the question is, why do you need a Hermitian, Hermitian matrix? Uh, if you have permission matrix, then you can have real eigenvalues. Right. Okay. Right. But uh, as a matter of fact, so we, we've done some other work where we looked at uh, not adding the imaginary part there. So this matrix, um, if you take A without the imaginary part, it's a skew-symmetric matrix, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can do SVD on this matrix, right? And then you can still just consider the singular vectors corresponding to the extremal eigenvalues, to the extremal singular values, right? It's mm -hmm. actually even, in principle, it has the advantage that you can just, you, you may not, so, uh, I mean, the, the graph may not necessarily even be skew symmetric and you can do an SVD on it, right? But just to, to go back to this particular question, so you have M minus M transpose. So this particular construction is, is important because it also arises in ranking. Remember in ranking, you have problems that are R minus R J, right? So we, players have trends, play, then they play matches, right? And the outcome of a match 
is you can pick and choose your favorite probabilistic model like uh, Bradley, B, Bradley Lusteri or but the very simplest thing, just think that the output of the match is just a noisy version of Ri minus Rj, just a difference of the strength of the two players. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that matrix is a skew-symmetric matrix, right? It's, you can show it's in just expectation rank two. It's a, even a skew-symmetric matrix, it's a given rank. And you can show in this example, it's a, it's a rank two skew-symmetric matrix. And you, you can even get back, you can prove that you can get back the strength of the players R1 to Rn just from the top two singular vectors of your SVD. So, so it's a very legit question you can, uh, so we haven't tested in this setting for clustering vector graph by not adding the imaginary part here. But it's, it's an interesting problem, yeah. It's, um, All right, I'll make sure to transmit the answer, thank you. Okay. There was a ton of questions. Um, so thanks again a lot, uh, Mihai. It's always cool to see yes. how useful uh, these spectral methods are. Um, yes, thanks a lot again for the invitation. And then if you have any other questions, feel free to write and send me an email. And yeah, yeah. Happy to discuss. Or if you have ideas of how to solve some of the problems I mentioned at the end, mm -hmm. I'm happy to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, that's when it gets interesting, right? Like when you have a very big graph and then somewhere it's hiding. It's yeah, I, I interesting think the challenging problem, problem is, is this one here. You have a much yeah. bigger graph. There's an ambient cluster that dominates the graph. And then yeah. you have these pockets of structures in different corners of the graph. But again, the structure here, that's the key. The structure here is not coming from edge density. It's coming from edge density and something else clicking. Here, by clicking, I mean there's a the consistent ranking relationship, right? Or or there's the consistent flow, there, there's some flow imbalance, right? Like I, I can find three clusters such, such that 90% of the edges flow from one to two, from two to three. But what makes the problem hard is that you have to design algorithms that simultaneously do the clustering and this structured uncovering. So not just clustering. If you just do clustering, maybe that's a bit easier, but it's clustering and an auxiliary sort of task structure that you have to find. I think that is challenging and doing this in a, regime where the ambient graph dominates, I think it's, it's most difficult. Yeah, and then also guessing this point in this case becomes maybe even more important because there's so many different ways in which you can find like small structures. Exactly, you're gonna find when something no matter what. There. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly, you're gonna, yeah. I mean, the, the point is, yeah, once you found the structure, yeah, how do you d d design <clears throat> uh, tests that tell you, okay, how robust or how to take significant that ranking that the structure you uncovered is. So you can potentially, you know, look at distribution, do permutation test and look at the distribution of the imbalance flow mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and things like that. I, I, yeah, I think that would be a natural step to consider. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, um, so I guess this, uh, then we can say, see you next week. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll do a shameless plug because uh, Katerina, the back coach, as to, uh, today confirmed that she'll be the speaker for next week. It wasn't, it wasn't confirmed. So we'll be hearing from her next week. Okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. See you all. Bye. Okay. See Thanks all. a lot. See you all. Bye Thank bye. you, Mihai. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye.